Wrapping with Reef Bum is sponsored by Bulk Reef Supply and Ecotech Marine. Hey, what's happening, everybody? And welcome back to another episode of Wrapping with Reef Bum. I'm your host, Keith Berkelhammer. So on today's live stream, I welcome Shane Backer, who owns SBB Corals, which is in Jersey City, New Jersey. What's going on there, Shane? going on there keith oh you know not a whole hell of a lot it's like to uh finally have you on the show man and talk reef and talk what about whatever right absolutely yeah 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 so um before we start chatting with shane i want to thank the sponsors for this show both bulk reef supply and ecotech marine really appreciate these companies supporting the live stream and i appreciate all you folks out there Tuning in, I see there's a bunch of you already in the uh, chat. ACI, what's happening there? Chris, Ari, Sturgis Reef, uh, Great Bitter Reef, Paul, our moderator. What's happening, everybody? Wade Riles. And, um, yeah, so, folks, I see um, a bunch of you in there. Let's get those likes up as usual. We always want to kind of hit that like button so more people can find the uh, live stream. And as usual, please drop your questions and comments in the chat. We're, uh, we will pivot, right, uh, Shane, based on uh, what we're talking about and what the chat's looking like. Try to incorporate the, uh, the audience into the uh, live stream is always a, uh, a good thing. So, man, let's, uh, let's talk about your, uh, your reefing journey. How, how long have you been reefing? When did you start? Yeah. You know, it, it feels like it's only been like a couple of months because <laughs> time is just speed warping. Um, especially we just had a nine month old baby now. So Ooh. it's like time is triple A. Oh boy. There you go. <laughs> if, my, if my wife starts yelling and screaming, it's probably because the baby's awake and she's, uh, you know, not, not, not hasn't slept for a week, but, but yeah, no, it's been, um, I think like, you know, the first time I got a tank, it was a bio cube. And I think that was like in 2016. So, you know, it's oh, almost wow. been now like eight years. Yeah. That you, so you haven't really been in too long. No, I mean, I had the bio cube, you know, for about a year. And then it basically just went like straight to like just setting up as many tanks as, as I could. Yeah. So how did that happen, man? Like what, uh, what like just uh, motivated you to go, uh, you know, ramp it up so quick? 
Yeah, man. I just, I guess I got bit by the, by the bug early and it just became like an addict in terms of like just collecting and collecting and like trying to find like the newest thing. And, you know, it was like the bio cube was great because it was all included. It was like, you know, you could put it in a small space, but you know, very quickly I basically filled it up. You know, we had a, we got like the, the live rock, you know, I, from, I forgot what the company was, but it was like real, like live rock. So the first thing we just like put the rock in there and it was so cool to see like, you know, what can come out of the yeah. rock. There was like, you know, I think we, we got like a, like a, like a pistol shrimp that came out of there. And then it was like, all right, let me get a few frags. And then it was like, all right, let's glue them to the rocks. And then quickly it was like, all right, let's just level the rocks. Let's just put like, you know, black egg crate over the rocks. And, you know, we basically just filled it up completely to the point where it's like, we can't put anything else in here. <laughs> so then I had to figure out like, you know, what the next step was. And then from there, it just kind of like exploded into, you know, it was just keep collecting as much as we could. Were, were there any um, tanks in particular that you saw that just really kind of stood out and, and um, you know, helped kind of light that fire? Yeah, not really. I mean, I think like the goal was always to like get like a 180. I think that's kind of like the vision for every newer reef keeper because it's like a very standard size. Yeah. And so, you know, we basically went from like the bio cube right to like a 180. Sweet. And was that a, uh, was that an SPS dominant? I mean, you went like, did you go uh, like all in on SPS? So really like people who know me early on, they, they know us for our Zoes. Um, like we put out a lot of like the high end zones. I don't know if you've even heard of these, like Oscar, the grouch was like one of them. Um, we were like, <laughs> we were, you know, we basically helped put out like the grandmaster Krakatoa. That was something that I originally collected and, and partnered, um, with Rudy Batera on. But yeah, it was like originally like we were just collecting zones. Um, that was like our passion. And then, you know, once we collected like every zone that was on the market, we said, all right, what's next. And then we just, you know, started collecting SPS. And then, you know, it basically just rolled into like every other type of coral you could think of. Wow. Yeah, that's um, that's pretty insane, man. I mean, that's not a long period of time to kind of like, um, you know, get that uh, that deep into it. But it is a it is a uh, an addiction. That's for sure. And, and um, it's um, <clears throat> but it's it's a fun addiction, you know. So and, and that's what reef keeping is all about is just uh, having fun. And if you have a passion for it and collecting uh, stuff, then um there's just always seems to be something else that you could add to the uh, collection, which I guess is a problem. <laughs> Big problem. <laughs> <laughs> so, all right, man. Um, so you got this business. How, how long has this business been running? So the business has been running, you know, it depends what you call a business because I think <clears throat> like even when we first had the bio cube, you, we quickly learned like if we can grow this, we could basically like, you know, cut it, sell it and then buy more. So that aspect of it basically started right away. But in terms of like the business and forming LLCs and all that, you know, I want to say it was like, I don't even like maybe like 2020 or 2021 was when we actually formulated the company. So it, it's been around for maybe three or four years. That's be corals in a sense. So that, that kind of started like right around COVID. I mean, how, how, um, how did that impact things? I mean, obviously I think people really got into reef keeping during COVID because you had a lot of new people that came into the hobby because people had more time at home for hobbies and whatnot. So I think reef keeping certainly picked up some new um, folks that way, but also, you know, people that were already into reef keeping and had a reef tank at their houses, uh, you know, it was, it was uh, pretty, pretty easy to kind of just sit there and look at the tank and, and, um, want to add to that tank or maybe start a new tank. So that's, um, that was probably good timing, I guess, in your part. Yeah, no, it was great timing. I mean, we definitely like, not to say we cashed in on like the whole pandemic, but yeah, I mean, for us, it was really good. Um, you know, we definitely grew our brand and, and we had a great time selling, you know, it's funny because, you know, when you start a business, you don't really realize where you are in time. And, you know, I, I it's like, I wish I was like where I am in business right now before COVID, because then we really would have, you know, not to, like cashed in. I mean, everyone had their stimulus checks. Everybody was at home and it, it really was like a boom time, I think for the coral industry. So yeah, it was a great time, you know, uh, business wise. So, the, you know, there, there's been, there's been some articles out there, stuff been written, been said that, um, you know, the last, um, year or so, or maybe a couple of years that things have slowed down for certain businesses in, in the uh, reef keeping, uh, business. Has that 
been uh, true with you guys or has it um, been um, not the case? I mean, I really want to say it's not been the case because, you know, we're pretty much having like record breaking months every month um, that we're in the business. I can say, though, that is it is mu it is a much harder sell than it used to be. And, you know, what does that mean? Right. It means that people still want to spend money, but they have less money to spend. So I really think in order to meet that demand, you, you kind of really do have to drop your prices. And, you know, it's a scary thing because you don't want it to be a race for the bottom, right? Because then everyone will bottom out. But I do feel like if you're able to drop your prices to meet the demand of the, the new market, I think you can still grow. And, you know, in a sense, that's what we've done. I mean, we have like different levels, right? Like there's a super high end where like you're getting, you know, some crazy money, but then there's also the middle and the lower end. So I feel like if you're able to adapt to that, you're, you can still grow, grow your company. You know, the other thing is like we talk about being an addict, you know, collecting. I mean, we're like addicts trying to find new customers, like whatever it is, whether it's Facebook, Instagram, Reef to Reef, podcast, right? Like there's just all these avenues. And I feel like if you're hungry for that, you, you could there's always a new customer that you can find. Right. Right. There's a lot of different platforms where you could reach potentially uh, new customers. So, you know, one thing you and I were talking right before we went um uh, live is is shipping and you know i mentioned to you and a lot of people know that i um i'm getting out of the online shipping game it's just been too expensive for me being in in a, a, a rural area it's been um a lot less reliable utilizing um ups so it's uh, it's been a source of frustration for me and aggravation and and uh yeah so you know, it's like crap man i don't need that stress and and it's it's you know my margins have been going a little bit down because of the uh, the whole shipping costs and what have you what's uh, what's your take on the uh, the shipping industry i mean i know um for a time freight costs had gone up a lot i think from what i understand they've gone down but then they've gone back up but um yeah shane give us your uh, overview in terms of what's happening with the uh, the shipping industry for shipping live animals yeah, I mean, I think for us, like it's it's basically like a necessary evil. Um, if we want to maintain and stay in business, we're we're gonna have to adapt with the shipping times. You know, whether the prices go up or whether it's harder to ship or whatever it is, like we we kind of just have to accept it. Like whatever the price is, we're gonna have to pay it. You know, whether we want to, you know, charge the customers a higher ship rate. I mean, currently we charge a flat fee of forty five dollars, and you know, we we give free shipping over four hundred dollars. And, you know, it's a huge cost. I mean, shipping is definitely our number one cost yeah. um, of goods sold, 100%. And, you know, it's a challenge. In terms of your question of is the price going up, you know, I, I honestly don't really know. Um, I, I don't know because I think we just started heavily shipping in like 2023 it's hard to say like we haven't seen like a double or triple i think just because we're we're newer in the business but you know with that said like whatever they're going to charge us we're, we're going to pay the one thing i can tell you is we are constantly looking for new shipping companies and when we find them we call them up and we say hey listen you know we're sending out x amount of boxes here's our numbers like can you beat this guy and you know unfortunately for the shippers like it literally is whoever's going to give us the best deal is who we're going to give our business to and, and you're talking about third-party shippers so you're not talking about shopping between fedex and ups you're talking about like using ups and going between different third parties that right handle ups Absolutely. Yeah. We tried to get a, a direct account with UPS and it was like a nightmare. The prices were much higher. Like they said, like, if you don't meet your quota, like we're going to increase your, it was a nightmare. So yeah, it is definitely a third party shipper that, that we're looking for. You know, and so you were talking about in terms of what you would charge for minimums in terms of shipping, you know, I think it, when I first started shipping a few years ago, um, I think I was shipping free for any orders over $300. I think it was that. And then um, maybe a year later or whatever it was, I upped it to 350 and you know now I'm doing 400. Um, I had been charging a flat $50 um, you know shipping fee. Now I'm at 100 bucks because um, that's kind of like what it cost me. Uh, you know I, I am getting out of it, but it's really to discourage the smaller orders because it's you know when people order one or two or three frags, the, you know, there's just not a lot of money in it to, you know, to make if you're selling frags that are 50, 60, 70, $80 frags and you're picking up like a good chunk of that shipping. And and so it's not only the shipping um, 
fees that you're paying the um, the overnight carriers, but box costs, right? Heat packs, bags. You talked about oxygen before we got on the air. You know, um, you know, if if you want to look really up the chances for survival, if there's a delay in shipping, then you should be um, injecting oxygen into those bags with the uh, with the coral. And you know, that's an that's a whole setup cost in terms of you know capital uh, expenditures that you need to spend to to pay for that kind of equipment setup. Um, so there's there's a lot of things that. Um, get baked into shipping a box of corals and it's um it's become more and more expensive yeah and and you know it's crazy because on some boxes i mean we we do lose money i mean it's it's sad to say but like a lot of the stuff we do we do a lot of sales on reef to reef and you know we do a lot of like dollar and five dollar drops i mean we mm. you know we really try to give back to the community and we try to make the corals affordable and it's like sometimes people are getting like 30 corals for like I mean, it's crazy to say, but like a couple hundred dollars or like four or five hundred dollars. And it's like when you think about it, like it's almost like going into an Indo box. And then from here to California, I mean, if the thing is 50 pounds, I mean, it's costing us, you know, 140 pound uh, dollars yeah. to ship the box plus the, yeah. the box fee and the bag fee, yeah. like everything you're mentioning. It's like, holy shit, yeah, like this is losing. starting to add up. Yeah. Well, M, thank you so much for that super chat. I need your Oregon tort, Keith. <laughs> it grew phenomenally for me until I accidentally killed it. I love the uh, Oregon Blue Tour. That is like just my probably one of my favorite uh, SPS. Is is that a, a popular coral among your customers? We actually are not growing that, oh, so really? I can't say if it is or if it's not. Yeah, hmm. that's uh, that's interesting. Yeah, you know, I guess not all um, you know um, online growers do sell that, but um, yeah, that's a uh, that's an OG, I guess. That's an OG coral. Um, what else did I want to talk to you about? Um, yeah, so shipping, it's just, um, you know, to me, it's its a, um, it's, it's tough. And also in terms of like trying to file claims, if, um, if, if UPS screws up and, you know, it gets delayed by a day and you got, got some DOAs, um, it's not a simple process to file a claim and actually collect on that claim. It would seem to be like a layup, right? They, uh, they screw up, there's a mechanical delay on a flight, uh, and the thing ends up getting there then the next day, you know, two days, not instead of one day. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fighting with, the, with these guys. It's like, what, what, what's there to fight about? I mean, you know, the only thing that you're not covered for is like a weather delay, right? Even if you pay insurance for a package, let, let's say you got a, a $900 box of corals that you ship out and you take out $900 in insurance, the shipper does not get to collect that $900 and lost corals if they die, if there is a weather delay, right? So if the plane gets delayed because of weather, then you're shit out of luck. There's nothing you can do about it. And, um, you know, that's, uh, that's why, I mean, I go crazy in terms of looking weather forecasts on my end, the customer's end, as well as the hub in between, you know? And um, sometimes you, you, you know, you can, but sometimes you don't have that luxury, right? And if you're, if you're shipping out, uh, you, you ship out a ton, right, of, um, of, of boxes a, a week. So can you have that luxury of kind of waiting, uh, pushed into the following week, or do you just have to really go for it? So, yeah, we just kind of throw the Hail Mary on that one. I mean, we don't you know. Number one, we definitely do not pay for any insurance. We, we feel like it's a waste. We don't even want to bother with them. Mm. But, you know, I can tell you that when we're packing our coral, like we're we're packing it in a way to survive a 48 hour trip. Yeah. So, like, we almost go in expecting a delay. I can tell you that UPS, like if we send 100 boxes, like maybe five of them, six of them. So they probably have like a six percent, um, you know, delay rate which is very low compared to fedex in our opinion the other thing is that you know the oxygen in my opinion is a life or death decision right so like we ship everything with oxygen and we know when we ship it with oxygen even if it's sps it can last a 48 hour trip and yeah. you know one of the things i mean we do like we we really try to go over and beyond like we give our clients a 14 day guarantee period and what does that mean? That means that we we cover all shipper delays and we basically cover it in your tank for 14 days. So like, and even with that, like we have a very low DOA rate when we ship. Yeah. Very low. That's good. Yeah. Um, so 
you mentioned oxygen. I mentioned uh, oxygen. What other tips can you give some of the uh, folks out there? Like, you know, if a hobbyist wants to send some frags to a buddy, you know, another reef keeper across uh, the country or wherever um, overnight, what uh, what would be besides oxygen? What would be the um, some tips you could provide for folks out there for ship that want to try to ship? So one tip, um, and you know, people might think this is not a good one, but I it's a proven one for me. For SPS. What we do is we actually dip the SPS in potassium chloride hmm. um, directly before we ship it. So imagine like, you know, you're taking the frag out of the tank and then we take the SPS frag and we put it in a dip and then we use a turkey baster and we spray the whole entire frag off. I mean, for us, like even if people get copepods, like we don't want them to get anything in there. We just wanted to get the cleanest specimen. But for some reason, when you do that with SPS before you ship, I honestly think it ships a lot better. I don't know why, but I've noticed that people say like, you know, oh, you, there's polyps in the bag and it's the cleanest thing. Like maybe you're just knocking off whatever's on the coral. So it, it, it's less irritated during shipping. So for SPS, I always recommend to dip it in potassium chloride, two tablespoons um, per, per gallon. And it's, it's just a blow off, right? You're just blowing it off with a turkey baster. And then what we do is we put it in like a little, uh, one of those ketchup containers, those little ketchup, uh, you know, portion containers. We drill a hole at the bottom. We cut slits in it. So that way the coral just stays in the cup the whole time it's in the bag. So those, those two things I would recommend for SPS if you want to ship out. And I honestly think that even if it gets delayed by one day, using the potassium chloride on the shipping helps it survive that 48 hour journey. So uh, you're just taking a turkey baster um, with a, uh, that KCL solution and you're basting it. So you're not leaving it in, in the uh, KCL for any extended period of time. I'm leaving it in the KCL for maybe five to 10 seconds as I'm basting it off. Gotcha. Interesting. Yeah. And, and temperature is also another big key, right? In terms of shipping, you got to make sure that you kind of have that down, whether you need a heat pack or a cold pack. So this is a huge one. And personally, in my opinion, I'd rather it ship cold than hot. Yeah. Like I'd rather a coral get there at 68 degrees than get there at 78 degrees. I know like a lot of hobbyists, you know, when they get it at first, they put the heat gun on it, obviously. And they say, oh, it's 68 degrees. You know, there's going to be an issue. And I'm like, no, 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 trust yeah. me. Like it's fine. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I try to ship it cold, but you know, obviously if it's, you know, winter, like you got to ship it with heat packs, like there's no way around it. Yeah. No, I've, um, I've seen, um, I've heard some anecdotal evidence that um, people have received corals that were like in the high, like 58 degrees and they were fine. So I, I, I think you're right. You know, corals can handle the, um, that, that kind of the, the lower part of the, uh, the extreme. But yeah, when you get to the, uh, to the really crazy high uh, temperatures, I mean, do you have like a cutoff point where um, if it's um, going to be like over a hundred degrees, at the uh, the destination, are you kind of like we can't do that, or are you just loading up more uh, cold packs? We're just loading up more cold packs. I mean, we're, we we ship it, you know, like you said before. I mean, with the volume, it's hard to to kind of hold it up. But I mean, you know, listen, like last week, no, I think it was two weeks ago, when like the whole country had like a super cold front and it was like snowing. Like, you know, we literally had like one box day. I think we had like on a Tuesday we had like thirty five boxes on a Wednesday. We had like 35, so like 70 in two days. And we just texted every customer. We're like, guys, like we're not shipping this week. Yeah. We're like, we, we, we can, if you want us to, but we're going to void our DOA policy completely. And then, you know, most people are very, I find like people in this hobby are very easygoing. Like they totally, Oh, no problem, man. Like to ship it next week. Yeah. So like in a severe situation, <clears throat> we're definitely looking at the weather, but like a cold day or a hot day, like that, that's okay for us. Like we're, we're sending it out. Reef Keeper, I just got home from UPS, shipped out some acros, and I dipped them for the first time after hearing Shane talk about this on his streams. Um, Chris Nawn, I've gotten shipping many times from Shane over the last few years. Absolutely some of the best care packaging in the uh, industry. There you go, man. Thank you, bro. <laughs> there you go. Um, all right. I, I also see a whole bunch of questions about um, you bringing in uh, wild or maricultured. So, but let's... Uh, <clears throat> Let's get into the um, to your systems, right? And in terms of how you like to run them with the uh, the equipment, so you put together 
and, and I thank you, Shane, for uh, taking the time to do this. You put you put together a couple of videos. We'll look at the first um, tour video where you're going to just kind of walk through and, and do some narration about the uh, the setups you have. And, and um, then we'll also uh, look at your coral uh, video. So we've got some great, uh, great stuff to drool over. What um, what total what total volume do you have, Shane, in terms of, um, you know, all the tanks in your basement? Yeah, so just a quick prelude is we have like four systems. I think one of them's like 650, the other one's like 650. So what is that? Like 13 plus we have another like 350 gallons, so maybe like 17. I, I would say like the total volume is around maybe 2100 gallons or so. Gotcha. Okay. Um one more shipping thing and this is an interesting thing uh NSP Reese uh, says this and I want to um bring this up to you wish more people that ship to Florida would leave out the heat packs that's a tough thing right because if you're shipping from a place that it's 30 degree low at night and then you're shipping to a place that's like 80 or 90 degrees you know uh, high the next day how do you handle it? you got to put the heat pack in right or else that's a that's a solid question and I'm really, really happy that you brought that up because, you know, that's a tough one. It's like, you know, you tell me not to put it. I want to put it. You know, it's a tough one. I do think, though, that in a case like that, we probably would put it because if it gets delayed and it gets stuck at a hub, like, for example, I think from me to you, it goes through Louisville, Kentucky. That's where the UPS hub is. And, you know, when it's like you know, like 25 degrees by me over there, it could be five degrees. So if it gets stuck at night, you know, it could get cold. Yeah. I mean, the other thing though, is that if it gets stuck at night, it should always, always be in a temperature controlled environment. So yeah, I mean, that's a tough one. Like, like for someone like you, for example, who's worried about that, I would just have your shipper ship it to your local, uh, you know, UPS facility for you to pick it up. So that way it's always in an air conditioned you environment. You know, man, I find a lot of customers are just not really <laughs> willing to do that, which is, um, you know, I mean, listen, I understand you want to have that box dropped right to your front door and it's convenient and all that stuff. But, you know, personally, I drive 45 minutes to the uh, local, the nearest UPS hub to pick up any corals or fish that I get. I don't want it... Um, bouncing around on that delivery truck and i've talked about this before in the live stream and videos and all that stuff and it's kind of like a public service announcement and and uh, i wish uh, more people would would just uh, understand that you know we're talking about live animals and the less stress you put on those live animals the better so if there's any possibility to have it held at a ups customer center or fedex uh, customer center then um you know i think i think it's worth extending yourself yeah, especially with the the comment that he made, because obviously if it's, you know, 35 degrees by me, but by you, let's say it's 90, like really, where's it going to get cooked? Like it's going to get cooked on the back of the truck, yeah. uh, especially for some reason, if it's delayed, like if it doesn't get to you till 8 p.m., which happens, like if that, you know, if you're concerned, like, you know, I, I think a good solution for you would be to pick it up at the, at the hub and well, at the, you know, a local facility in a sense. Yep. Um, I, and let's get to this one. Uh, super chat before I run the uh, the equipment video. Greg D, thank you so much for that super chat. <clears throat> All right, th th there's a question for us here. Waterbox 105.4. Um, I guess the phosphate levels in November were 2.02. .02. Weekly 20 gallon water changes got phosphate to 1.6. Tips for getting phosphate lower. No filter socks. NIOS 120 skimmer. I guess we would need more in terms of what the is going on with that system but uh what what's uh you know maybe maybe you answer this in the uh, the walkthrough video but what, what's your uh primary method of uh, nutrient reduction there shane i think it's it's the amount of coral load that we yeah, have in our system that's there, potentially that's doing the lion's share of it right i i think it is yeah 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 the other way you know the other thing is it's it's the way that we feed our food um, this basically the way we feed our food, there's a product out there. It's called American reef HPD. I don't know if, if you've heard of that before, but what it is, is you make this food and it kind of is like this gummy consistency and you take the food and you hang it from a bag. So the fish basically pick on the food and no food gets wasted because mm. it's like a piece of gum. The food goes right in their bellies. So there's there's no like decaying detritus. And I think the way that we feed our food basically regulates our PO4. So it doesn't, you know, we don't overfeed and it, like any food goes right to the fish's bellies in a sense. Yeah, I mean, you know, and some of the stuff that I do in terms of nutrient control besides skimming, water changes, um, 
you know, siphon out detritus. You could, I see um, Paul Graybeard or Reef mentioned using macroalgae for phosphate removal. So there's a bunch of different things that you can, you know, do, you know, like a refugium or algae reactor, um, algae scrubber, any of those things. But yeah, it's uh, it, it's a balance, right? So like you also said there, Shane, it's, it's also what you're putting into the tank and, and you got to kind of keep that in control too. If you're um, adding a lot of um, food and supplements and maybe amino acids and, and what have you, then um, stuff can accumulate over time. So I think, um, and we'll get into this, but it's, it's, you know, a lot of times I think um, reefers kind of fall into that trap of just dosing too much stuff. I agree. So, all right, man, let's, um, let's run the, um, the first uh, tour with the equipment and uh, Shane's going to narrate during this video. I think it's about what, 10 minutes or so, Shane? I think it's about eight, eight or eight, nine eight or minutes. Nine minutes. Yeah, so is. we'll uh, I'll run this and then we'll um, we'll come back. We'll do it. All right, guys. So I'm going to show you a tour of our whole entire farm. This is basically walking in right through the front door. We're in about 1,100 or so square feet, and you can see already it's absolutely packed. Boxes, shipping boxes. I'll take you through our farm first. As you can see, when we walk into the main room, we basically have four separate systems, and I'll kind of explain how this is all set up. And we basically put a tank on every single wall. There's, you know, really no more room for expansion. So as we walk in, you see that we have this first system, which is right here against the wall. What it is, it's three 180s plumbed together with three 40 gallon sumps. And then on the other wall, you'll see that this plumbing is a little crazy, but you know, we're not plumbing professionals, but it definitely does work. So you see there's three 180s, and along this other wall, we have two, and there's just more systems, which I'll show you. We have two frag tanks, which are part of that other side. The whole system right there, I believe, is about six or 700 gallons. It's like, like four 180s pretty much plumped together with two 40-gallon sumps. So this is system number one. This is our torch, euphilia, uh, and our one of our mushroom systems. The lights are off right now. I'll have to show you another video with the lights on a little later. But you can see that this system is pretty much completely packed with torches. And there's one dead right there. And yeah, sometimes we get death. I mean, there's no way around it. But this is just packed with torches and hammers and frog spawns. And then we have uh, one of our mushroom tanks, which is pretty much double stacked. Some of these mushrooms are awesome. We, we really started collecting like these giant yumas, which are awesome. But going down now into the sump section, you'll see that it's three sumps plumbed together three 40 gallon breeders. Kind of a pain to do it like this. We've cracked the glass many times just trying to line everything up, but it seems to work really well for us. Like I mentioned, we're not plumbing professionals, but we got the job done. This looks a little hairy right there, but you know, it works. Everything is running perfectly. So you can see. One thing that you'll notice is that for this system with the three 180s, we have six pumps running. Uh, which they're all centered here, there's a few over there, and the idea is that we have one pump running per return. So each return gets its own pump, so that way if one pump shuts off or malfunctions, then the system is still running. And then in terms of our systems, you'll see that we, we run it very simple. You put a lot of live rock. You'll see that there's just live rock that's completely packed in the system. Live rock packed in the sump. We believe in that heavily. And then we all we really use for our system is a skimmer. We have no GFO, no carbon, no UV. We don't use any of that stuff. I just, there's carbon right there, but that's just for when we go to coral shows, we bring the carbon. So yeah, this is uh, system number one. And now we're going to show you system number two. But before we do that, you'll notice that we use radions for all of our lighting. And we really like radions. This is the only thing we've really ever used. 
So everything in the farm is, is radions. So now this brings us to system number two, which on a camera it might look a little confusing, but it's basically, we'll start system number two over here. So this right here is system number two. This is actually our main system. This is the first system that we set up. Just trying to get a good angle of it. So this right here is system number two. It's three frag tanks. Those are about 60 gallons each, four foot by 24 foot frag tanks, one, two, three. And then there's a 180 also plumb to this. And then also plumb to this is these two tanks right here. You can see the plumbing goes along this wall and then it goes into this main sump. And then also a part of this system here is these two tanks that are like in the closet. We basically utilized every single square inch for tanks. There's still like one idea we found for expansion, which we'll share in a moment, but this is the back end of the system. This is like a utility closet. You can see that we have all of our ESV that we use for our two part. And this is where like all the mechanicals are for this system. And this system number two is heavily focused on SPS. And this system number two that you're looking at is about 600 gallons. I think it's a little more right now, but it's the 180. It's these three frag tanks. It's those two frag tanks and then the two frag tanks in the back. And then for the sump, you'll see that it's basically all plumbed into this sump. And then we had to put this expansion sump on here. Again, drilling holes through the glass and just basically putting that on there for those three frag tanks. This is also just run with a skimmer only. And you'll notice that this system, again, heavy on SPS, double stacked racks, uh, and this is where basically we or do most of our selling from so like these three tanks right here Are where all of our sales stuff are we just had a big sale So we just basically shipped everything out So what we'll do now is we'll go back to that 600 that first system take the euphilia and put it in here for sale You'll notice that it's hard to see on here, but each of these racks are numbered it's easy to see it here because it's all done in acrylic. So like numbers one through let's say 423 over here. So when we pack, we know exactly where each frag is. And again, these are all numbered systems. So that's system number two, which is heavily on our SPS. And again, you can notice that like every single square inch of this room is pretty much taken. We did have one expansion, so we have two more systems, but before I go into those two, you see how these two racks are stacked, these tanks are stacked? Our idea was to basically start stacking tanks everywhere we can, which is here, here, here. Um, so that's system number two. Now we'll flip around and we'll go to system number three. System number three is a 180 and a 120 plumbed together with two 40 gallon sumps. And you'll notice again, the same technique with the, with the pumps, one pump for each return. And again, this system is pretty packed. You know, it's just racks on top of racks. Our sales have gotten pretty big to the point where these tanks don't hold enough coral. Like th these tanks right here probably hold about 600 or 700 corals. So <clears throat> when we're doing a sale with like a thousand items, we now had to use these racks to put corals on. And these racks are also numbered. It's hard to see, but you see like 19 right there. So these racks are all numbered. So that way we can expand our sales. This is also an SPS system as well. And this system is really used for like a quarantine for the SPS. So you can see that like the sale stuff on here it's just mushrooms and then it will be ghanis on here. So if anything, you know, comes in with the SPS, it doesn't affect the mushrooms or the ghanis. And this is basically our quarantine for the SPS that comes in. And that's system number three. This system's about 360 gallons. And now for the final system, it's system number four, which is really our ghani system. It's just a 180 
with a you know simple sump, same thing, just a um, skimmer running, and this is basically our Ghani tank. Once the lights come on later, I'll take another video to show you guys like all the corals and stuff, but this is pretty much all Ghanis, and yes, we do get algae. You can see there's a bunch of algae there, there, and you know, we have to clean it pretty much all the time. Another cool thing is you can see how we set up our tanks that all the corals are basically like on these racks here. That way if we need to clean things, we just take the whole rack out and then we put it into like a container that fits the racks. And you can see pretty much all of our tanks are set up like that with these racks. Even in here, we got these racks. And this is a pretty cool tank right here. Those are, <laughs> those are all St. Thomas mushrooms. Again, I'll have to show you that with the light turned on. So that's basically all of the tank setups. And then just going back over here, kind of to the back end of the farm. You know, we have like our little whiteboard. And then we have our office. Our office is basically two desks that are just crammed into this little room right here. You can see we got like our multiple monitors when we're running sales. We got our two little helpers right here, Willard and Mildred. Bringing them to work every morning is a lot of fun. Then just a regular bathroom. So that's basically our whole farm setup. Hope you guys enjoyed it. I'm going to quickly show you guys now our RODI system as well. Just kind of showing it in the same video. You can see like we even built a shelf for all of our, you know, materials if you would. And then we have like this little closet right here, which is basically just a furnace room. But even that is just packed with our supplies. We got our little cups for shipping. All right, and we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna run that second video about the RODI system. But but dude, man, you uh, you made great use of the space. I mean, there is like not one square inch that is not uh, got some piece of equipment on it. It's uh, you, you find that right. I mean, I got a basement operation myself, <clears throat> and you really have to be very creative and think a lot about how to make the best use of the space when you don't have a lot of square footage and you're you're obviously uh overgrowing the space that you got there yep it's a challenge <laughs> <laughs> um so a number of questions uh so you got four systems and so what what uh it, it seems like the the, the way you're, you're doing the flow in those tanks is you're doing one pump per return line into these uh these tanks right and then you're doing some programming with the ch pumps to um get some randomized flow can you talk to us about the um and i apologize if you mentioned that specifically in the video i was uh you and i were chatting during it and um so i, I might not i might have uh, oh, there you go uh, i might have missed that that part of it but can you talk about what kind of flow you like to have in your uh, your tanks yeah, so typically with those CJ pumps, uh, as you mentioned, what we do is we, we run one pump per return line. So like on those 180s and 120s, they have two return lines. And, you know, it's just for, 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 safe, for safety. If one pump goes out, if a propeller goes out at night and we can't get to it until the morning, uh, the tank will still have flow. Um, also, for some reason, when the power flickers out, sometimes on and off, mm. sometimes only one of the pumps will come on. So that definitely helps uh, for safety mechanism. But for those pumps right there, we're probably running those at like 50%. And just on the return line, you know, we're just running at a straight constant 50%. Like there's no randomization in, gotcha. in that. Okay. Um, but for the insides of the tanks, we're running uh, MP40s. And, you know, we, we really, we don't like a crazy amount of flow. Like we just like, like, honestly, we like lower to medium gentle flow as long as the coral is kind of getting brushed like all around it. And usually with the MP40s, we, we run one on either side of the tank. And, um, you know, we run those at complete random. Uh, we run those at random uh, programs and we run those at, at random speeds as well. And then we typically have like one pump at the bottom of the tank also. So we have like three MP40s for like the those 180s. Um, RC Reefers asking, how much flow do you leave the uh, the Ghanis in? Is that any different than the uh, the acro tanks and and the other types of corals you got in the systems? It is, yeah, it is. So for that tank, we it, the Ghanis have really low low flow. It, they're barely 
even moving in there. It, it's pretty much like just the return line in that tank. And we don't, we kind of angle them at the surface. So the, there's not too much flow on those. So I would say those get really low flow. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, algae in, in, in some of those uh, tanks. What's, what is the, um, are, you, are you guys finding you have to do a lot of cleaning of the frag racks or do you have some um, you know, specific methods in place to, to help mitigate the, uh, the algae that you have to clean off the racks? So we're constantly battling algae. I mean, it's it pops up everywhere. I don't know why. I mean, we don't run a UV. We don't run GFO. Uh, we do run our NO3 at like 20 to 25. Wow. Our, our PO4 is typically, yeah, our, our PO4 is typically 0.12. So, you know, we're constantly battling algae. I mean, we're, we're just, you know, cleaning racks, changing racks, cleaning fra frag plugs. Um, you know, we have every type of algae eating fish you can imagine in there. We load it up with snails. I think... What we're doing now is we're we're slowly lowering our NO3, maybe to bring it to like between five and ten, just to see if that like stops the algae growth. But yeah, we definitely have algae. You know, it's impossible not to. I think. Yeah, I mean, are are you guys, um, you know, doing any um, any any need for nitrate or phosphate dosing? We do. We we dose well. Phosphate, not really. Our natural PO4 stays around 0.12. But for NO3, we're we're dosing a lot. Our it consumes a lot of NO3, and for that, we're basically making our own mix from uh, you know sodium nitrate. What uh, what's the reason why you guys don't use UV? That's a good question, and we we try to UV, and for us, it was just like it was just complicated. It was like all right, you got these bulbs, and then you got to change the bulbs, and like when do you have to change the bulbs? And for some reason, in my mind, I just got this idea where it's like. Whatever it's stripping from the water, I, I just feel like maybe it's stripping something that the corals like, whether it's, you know, the corals, corals having better coloration or, or better polyp extension. I just, whatever it's stripping from the water, I just didn't want to strip that out of the water column. And so we just never really used it again. I know a lot of growers that do use it. Yeah. And I know a lot of growers that don't use it. Um, so it's, you know, this is something that like we just didn't want to mess with. In a sense, a couple of questions. Um, uh, deep blue sea 20 to 25 nitrate, 1.4 phosphate. Uh, is that what you say? Question mark. That's about what, what you were saying. Um, interesting. I wonder what um, and how they feed. So, yeah, talk to us, uh, Shane, about anything that you add to the uh, to the water in terms of you know, feed for coral, amino acids, any of that stuff. So, we don't use any amino acids, um, we don't use any pretty we don't really do much honestly we use like so actually things we add to the tank we add no3 to the tank on a daily basis if the po4 goes under 0.8 we add po4 um we dose a lot of iodine we're constantly checking iodine there is a successful way to test iodine from home it's a con crazy concoctionary test that someone on Reef to Reef came up with, and it actually works. Yeah. So, like, if anyone's interested in that, I'll give the link to Keith so he can post that in the in the chat, uh, you know, in the comments later for the video. Um, so we we are putting you know iodine in there. Uh, we feed that American Reef HPD, like I mentioned, we hang it from a bag, and we feed Benepets. We just started doing Benepets, which the Ghanis and everything seem to really like. And and that's it. You know, we're not dosing any type of trace elements or or any of those things. Um, you know. Um, what about bacteria dosing? Have you ever played around with that? Never, never. never. Um, so you mentioned um, iodine and using some crazy um, test. What about ICP testing? So we were testing ICP every two weeks on four systems, which is a lot, right? You're sending in eight tests a month. Yeah, expensive. But yeah, we, we, but once we figured out how to test for iodine, we, we just like completely stopped doing it. We haven't sent in an ICP test for, for a few months. There are a few things though, that I do want to start to consider, uh, like fluoride. I, for some reason now we just got like these thoughts, like, all right, what can we do better? So we're, we're going to send in some ICP tests and, and maybe we'll play a little bit with fluoride and stuff. But yeah, we, we haven't sent one in for, for a long time. 
Yeah, Chris Meckley turned me on to fluoride dosing, and I've been doing ICPs with the uh, with the fluoride. And what I do notice with the fluoride dosing is that the blues, um, the tips on, on certain corals really do pop, which, um, you know, you want to be careful not to, uh, to overdose it. So it's definitely important to do the ICP testing um before that but uh yeah that's interesting so you're you're pretty much saying that uh, in terms of the elements you're you're most concerned about iodine yeah i mean like we know our salt really really well and, and like what, we what, what is the salt yeah somebody asked that question too what are you guys using for salt yeah um so what we're using right now is we're using a mix we do the red sea pro and the red sea regular so we use the red bucket and the blue bucket we do a 50 50 mix uh, we were doing all Red Sea Pro for like a year. Like originally we we're using Tropic Marin and then we stopped that for obvious reasons. And then we went to the Red Sea uh, Red for like a year. And then what happened was is we were like every week we do a 15% water change. And we actually like to keep our alk really low. Like we find that the tenuous and stuff are, are best. They look the best at like an alk of seven. Wow. And so. Yeah, that's near natural seawater. Yeah. Yeah. And again, that might not work for everyone. Like we just noticed in our tanks that like it has the most polyps and the best coloration at seven. And then the thing is though, with the Red Sea Pro, the ALK is like 12. So like mm. every week we were doing a water change and the ALK was jumping from like seven to 8.2. And I'm like, you know, everything looks great, but like, I don't know if this is good. So recently we just started adding and, you know, we do actually, we are considering switching back to Tropic Marin now. And so, like, part of our transition into switching back to Tropic Marin was to mix the red and the blue uh, Red Sea together. Because the Red Sea uh, blue, I think the ALK is like seven and a half. So when you mix the two, it mixes out like eight and a half. So, like, that, like... We figured like that would be our transition into like Tropic Marin. So like we have like maybe 20 bags of each right now or maybe, no, I'm sorry. We have like 10 bags of each. And once that's done, we'll probably go to Tropic Marin. So dude, you mentioned um, your alkalinity and um, you also mentioned in the video using two part. That's, um, that's a lot of two part, man, for 2000 gallons, right? You're probably going through a lot. You're using the ESV two part. So it is, but, but I think that for us it's okay because i think we're getting a lot of our trace elements from that two part so like yeah we're dosing you know obviously it's on a doser and it is a lot of alk it's a lot of it's a lot of calcium but to be honest the most is the magnesium the magnesium just gets like completely deplenished it's like every time we make our salt we have to put like one gallon of magnesium into a 200 gallon drum just to bring it up. Mm. But I think a lot of our trace elements are coming from the ESV. So that's maybe why we don't have to dose as much as maybe someone else might have to. What about pH? You know, obviously <clears throat> if you're dosing two part, you you probably don't have a depressed pH. What, what is your um, pH range typically in your systems? It runs at about 8.4. Yeah, it's pretty elevated. And I, I, and I, I don't know what it is. I don't know why it's so high. I think also like the, the facility, the house that it, that it's in was built in the 1800s. So like I have this theory like that the insulation is very, very low. So a, <laughs> lot, a lot of, of like, the, you know, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe, but I think, and cause one of my, uh, one of someone who works for us actually lives right across the street, which is like super convenient. And he, I basically converted his whole basement to tanks also, uh, <laughs> And his pH is, is like the same. It's like 8.4. So it's it's got to be from the ESV and potentially just being in an old house. Yeah. So what happens, um, <clears throat> you know, in the wintertime? I mean, do you have windows down in the basement there that you keep open when it's, you know, warm enough? <clears throat> we do. Yeah. Okay. We do. What about when it gets really cold and the windows have to be shut? We shut them. <laughs> yeah. And, and so the pH doesn't drop that much? It, it doesn't yeah it stays that, it stays up it's there it's that uh, flimsy insulation there that helps you uh, <laughs> bring that uh, air from the outside in without you even knowing it <laughs> yeah yeah I, I don't know i think maybe it's the esv you know I, I wish i had an answer you know i don't i don't know what it is but it, it might be the esv as well yeah i um for me i i put in a um an air exchange unit like a few years ago and that was like a game changer i mean i have um you know all my stuff is in the basement but, um, you know, in the wintertime, the windows never are open at all. But um, with the air exchange unit, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty sweet because I can actually dial it up and down. I uh, typically run it like at 20%. So it's on like 20% of the time. 
But if I need to boost that pH, I can run it at 40%. So it's pretty cool, you know, that you could actually uh, do that. And then in, in the uh, in the spring, in the summertime, in the fall time, the windows are open and I shut it off. But um, you know, it's um, it's not a uh, it's not a cheap thing to initially have installed and set up. But um, if you're looking to have that elevated pH and you've got some really tight um, you know seals around the uh, you know windows and and whatnot, then I've, uh, I've I've definitely found it to be extremely um, helpful. Um, I've got some more questions for you about equipment, but let's let's uh, let's take a look at the uh, that second video, which is about your uh, RODI and the makeup water, and then we'll we'll uh, we'll come back and look at that. So let me um, let me run that one. And this is a Sweet. this is a shorter one, right? This is a couple minutes. Yeah, I think it's like two or three All minutes. Right, there we go. So again, a continuation of the first video going now into our storage area slash RODI uh, water making machine shut the door it's cold out so now this is our this is kind of like our storage you can see that you know we have storage for boxes we're shipping about 120 to 150 boxes a month so we're constantly going through these boxes here huge expense of shipping in these boxes it's crazy but let me just kind of get down here a little bit. It's a kind of a mess, you know, because we're constantly working in here. Um, you can see that we have a bunch of boxes. These are boxes. There's just a small leak in here, so we have to cover all of our, our big boxes, our indoor boxes. And you can see that, you know, this right here is our RODI, uh, you know, water making machine. It's basically 400 gallons. And the salt that we use is the Tropic Marin Pro. We do a 50-50 mix of this salt. And I can talk about that more, why we do that. Also, it's low on magnesium, so we have to dose like one gallon of magnesium in each of these vats to bring it up uh, to 1,400. And then here is our RODI, uh, our you know water making unit. It's a BRS dual membrane. And you can see that this basically feeds all of the RODIs, uh, the top off for all the tanks. So you can see like wires going everywhere. That blue wire goes into the other room. You basically punch through the wall there. Um, that one you can see goes over into there and it feeds all of that. So this is just to give you an idea of our system. And we have like these, all these like, don't forget to shut off the heater because if you don't shut the heater off and it burns through this plastic, then this whole thing goes bad and we know how expensive those are. And that's happened like so many times, you know, not so many times, but it's definitely happened once. So, and then you can see we have like all of our sediment filters and everything else. So let me just take you again, quick walk through, just so you can see it again from this side, more boxes, shipping boxes that we're gonna send out. So that's pretty much the walkthrough. I appreciate you guys spending some time and, and looking at all this. And there's obviously nobody here right now because it's super early in the morning, but usually there's like three of us here and it's just a madhouse. I mean, there's not a lot of room to walk, so we kind of have to make do with what we got. All right, we're back. So, um, all right, man, a couple of questions. So, um, in terms of changing membranes and, and cartridges, what's, uh, what's the deal with that, man? So people think I'm like crazy when I'm, when I'm, when I tell them this, but you know, we have a, a lot of customers that they say to us like, Hey, you know, our, our SPS looks dry. You know, it looks dry. It doesn't have any polyps. It doesn't have any color. Like it's not dead, but it just looks like it's dry. And so I joke around with them and I say, hey, I say, when's the last time you change your membrane? And they go, what? what's a membrane? <laughs> and I'm like, do you make your own like water? They go, yeah. I'm like, well, how long has your system been up? They go, two years. I'm like, so you're telling me you didn't change your membrane for two years? And so basically what I'm trying to say, <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that, you know, anyway, they call us, we say, change your membrane, change out all your filters and like, boom, like two to three weeks later, you know, they're, they're tenuous or fuzzy. They get in colors or getting crusting. And I'm like, you should change your membrane. 
So anyway, we change our membrane every two months. We change all of our sediment filters once a month, and we change all of our resins every two weeks. Now, here's the thing. People think I'm crazy, and none of this is proven, and I'm absolutely not a scientist, and I'm not an expert. I will tell you that. I'll be the first one to say that. But for us, in our opinion, and you know, we're changing, I would say, you know, every week we're using 300 gallons. So that's 1,200 gallons a month you know, going through like a dual membrane, like you see the video, right? You see that system. So 1200 gallons is going through that system. If, if, if three months goes by and we don't change our membrane and we forget, right? We all forget to do things, right? Like all of a sudden, like three to four months, like late, like I look at my coral and I'm like, wait a second, something looks off. I don't know what it is. The polyps, there's less polyps. They're not crusting as much. You know, it, it, it just look a little dry. We're talking about the SPS. They look a little dry. I go, what is it? I go, oh, shit. I go, I haven't changed my membrane for three to four months. So I don't know what it is. Something, I believe, is getting through there. And our, see, I'm on city water. So our mm. TDS out of the taps, like 275. Uh, that's, that's definitely you need to uh, be careful on. But I, I feel like something's getting through. So what we what do we do? We change our membrane. We change all the you know the machine. We flush out like fifty gallons. So we you know we burn off fifty gallons. We do water change. No joke. Two weeks later, full polyps. Things are crusting. Things are looking great. And I don't know if it's like a complete coincidence, but you know now I tell all my customers change your membrane every two to three months. Some people want to kill me. They say, oh, that's a waste of money. Why would you tell us to do that? Like I had another one of my customers, he said he, that he changed the membrane like eight months ago. He said, oh, I don't know what to do with my corals. They're not looking good. I said, just change all your membrane, change your membrane, change out everything. He did that. He flushed off 50 gallons worth of water. Boom. His stuff bounced back. Like, I don't know if there's anyone on this call who I've told that to and it's worked, but it, please chime in. So you don't, ever, people don't think I'm crazy, but that that's what we do. You know, we're, we're insane with our water. We have to have the cleanest water. Do you ever do uh, uh ICP testing of the, uh, of the, um, makeup water? We do. You do. And I've never found anything in it, you know, whether we change it right away or it's been three to four months, we never find anything. And, you know, I don't know what it is. And we never let the water go in our tank, you know, anything over zero. Like if it's one, like it never goes to one because we're so proactive about it. But like even some people who don't change their membrane for six months to a year, they still have a TDS of zero coming out of their, of the, of the meter. Right. So I don't know what that is. You know, but it, it just works for us. And I know some people who have recommended it to it works. So I, I would just challenge like anyone who's on this call who has SPS, who hasn't changed their membrane for six months or a year, who has like 250 TDS coming out of their tap. Just try it. Come back. Mention in the comments. Let us know if it worked for you. Um, Anderson Family Reef, do you um, measure the TDS to help you know when to change your membrane or have you gotten past that and basically you know when you need to change it? No, we're insane. We, we check our TDS no matter what. I have a TDS meter at every single stage. Like the second it comes out of the membrane, the second it goes into the first resin, when it comes out of the first resin, into the second resin, then when it comes out of the last resin, constantly, constantly checking it because I'm scared that one day we'll put the wrong resin maybe into one of the vials or, you know, we'll, we'll connect the, the wires wrong or something. So I'm constantly, constantly testing it. And you know, another big one is, and, and again, maybe this is just a theory, but like, I know some people when they, they top off their water, they're using the water directly from their RODI system and with no flush valve even. So I have this theory, like every time we turn our, our RODI system on, we flush out like 30, 40 gallons of water before we start using it again. So like, go ahead. No, I was going to say, so like it, this continuous, like using the water from the RDI system to top off your water, like number one, you better have a flush valve. Um, and I think even a flush valve of like, if you have really high TDS, like I just feel like the flush valve isn't enough. So like we would always recommend burning off like 40 gallons of water before you put it into your reservoir and then use that clean water that way. Uh, what about a chlorine blaster? I've never even heard of that before. Uh, Chris from ACI says you need chlorine blasters before the membrane ours lasts a minimum one year. What, what about a chlorine blaster? You know, I really appreciate that comment because we haven't tried that before, but I definitely should look into that. Um, we have like the regular chloramine filter, you know, that BRS provides. 
Um, I don't know if that's the same thing, but if it's not, I definitely need to look into that. Wife Price Reefer, thank you so much for the super chat. And that apparently is your first ever super chat on a live stream. Congratulations. <laughs> that's awesome. Um, oh, we got a lot of comments coming through here. And um, yeah, so it's uh, my question to you, uh, and I apologize if you mentioned this before, uh, Shane, what percent water changes do you guys do um, and how often? So on most of the systems, like the three systems that we have, there's four systems. Um, one system we ship water out of. So that one gets a water change whenever we ship water. But, you know, typically if there's a rule of thumb, it's 15% every single week. Um, Connor at Coral View says, auto flushing was a huge upgrade for me in Chicago. Municipal water still running through about every eight months. Hmm. Interesting. Um Reef Exotico by Luis Aceves. What's happening there, Luis? I have that good Colorado water. My TDS is 25 going in. Whoa. <laughs> Yikes. Um, okay. So what, um, let's see here. So let, we got to look at some freaking corals, man, right? I mean, we've, we've, we're, we're over an hour in this live stream. We haven't shown one of your corals. So um, let me run that coral video. How long is this one? Um, Shane, there's a few. They're, is, they're like a minute or yeah, two. Yeah, so long, I strung them together. Or three. It's in portrait mode, um, you know. But like I said to uh, Shane, it's like you know what? It's good enough because you get the point. He's got some kick-ass stuff. So let me uh, let me roll the uh, the coral video and and some pretty insane stuff here. So let's watch that, and we'll come back and talk about the uh, the corals. All right. So I just kind of want to go through some of the corals that we have. So this is the Ghani tank. You can see this tank is pretty much all Ghanis. Dedicated Ghani tank. We keep the PO4 in this tank at around 0 0.20. The NO3 is around 15. And that's where we kind of find that the Ghanis like is higher nutrients. So a bunch of Ghanis for you guys. Lighting is a little funky here. I don't have the normal setting on it, but and then we go over to the next system, which is just a bunch of St. Thomas mushrooms. For some reason, we have like a huge St. Thomas kick. Um, and I think we brought in like, I don't know, maybe like six or 700 of them. It's really hard to find the yellow ones. Those are like the rarest ones. So a lot of people are always wondering like, why do those sell for so much? It's because it's like one out of like a hundred or like yellow. So like here's some more St. Thomas's just to give you an idea. And I find that, like, when you put them in higher light, they actually do like it a lot more. They color up a lot more. So some more St. Thomas's, and then, you know, you got, like, a yellowish type one here. And then there's some acros over here. A bunch of acro colonies. Just kind of going through some stuff here. Acros. And that's it for this system. And then these systems are usually full with frags for the sale stuff that we're doing. Um, we have another sale, so we're starting to set up some SPS frags. You can see that these are like all numbered. The numbers are so bright, it's even like hard to see the coral. But it's a really awesome system that we have there. And we're going over here to another SPS system. Just a bunch of colonies. Some of those smooth skins that people like. Some of these are really nice, like the grape juice. You can see it's got like some pretty good colors, unique, unique coloration for sure. So back to another t system. Um, again, just a bunch of St. Thomas mushrooms. You can see like out of all these, like this yellowish one right here is the one that we call the holy grail it's like one i would say out of like 200 of them coming in it's just crazy amount of st thomas mushrooms like there's another really nice like unique one there's very few of these unique ones like that one's unique that one's probably like one out of like 200 and some more over there you can see some other yellowish like that's a pretty unique one there crazy st thomas's that like one right there it's like a like a pinkish color almost really just different 
and then you have like that's it. And there's only like one super yellow one in like the whole entire bunch. So now we're gonna swing around here. Let's take a look at our torch tanks, which again is really just packed. This tank is actually like triple stacked. You can see we have like these baskets in the front. It's hard to see it with this camera, but more St. Thomas's, like four or five baskets of St. Thomas, and then torches growing really well. We do lose a few torches here and there. I don't know if it's because like they're growing into each other or what, but this is basically like a 180 that's just completely full. And then you see it's like got the stack there. And then here's some more torches. This is part of that big system when you first walk in. Hey, what's up everyone? Just want to let you know I'm looking for G Tiger, which is like really, really bright. And then you got like a holy grail there. So you can see some different torches. Torches. More torches. And then here is some of those rainbow hammers. Really, really nice rainbow hammers. And then the lights just change. Here's that mushroom system. It's just a bunch of mushrooms everywhere. Crazy. Some of these Yumas are crazy. They're like huge, like pretty much like the size of my hand. Like that one right there is like super unique. Some crazy coloration. Some more over here. Mushroom racks on top of mushrooms. Um, let's see here. So yeah, just some. There goes the lights again. These lights are really hard, I think, to keep. Some more acros. It's hard to see the lighting on these, so I don't know if it's even worth sharing. But some acros. And then we swing around the back. You shut these lights off over here. And then you're gonna see there's just more of some, some let's see here where we got some random mushrooms. We got some rock flowers, some really pretty rock flowers. Rock flowers, and then we got more St. Thomas's. So this is a pretty crazy St. Thomas. So a few. I don't know why we went so crazy on these St. Thomas's, but we did. Then another top tag, just more mushrooms and some random. And we are back. Whoa. That was a lot to take in. <laughs> That was a lot to take in. So there's um, one more video, and this, this was a first. Shane said, I sent you a bunch of video files before the show, and uh, I, I saw four of them, but I didn't, I didn't grab them all. And he's like, if you can grab the last one, it's a 10-second video. And I was like, well, I've never done that before during the live stream. I actually <laughs> downloaded a file from Google Drive and brought it into the live stream, but I was able to do it and I wasn't able to run it through the video editing software. So when I show this, if it starts to really mess with the live stream, I'm going to stop showing it. But uh, let's let's run that and see what uh, happens here. Hey, what's so, up, everyone? Um, Just want to let you know okay, I'm looking forward to like, 2020. Um, Got a lot of things cooking tilted up Tilted over the wrong way. But we, I think we get the gist. This looks like uh, that was full hmm. spectrum lighting and that was all the aquaculture at SPS you had in uh, one particular uh, tank. Yep, yep, exactly. I wonder why it came out that way. Wow, that's uh, dude, that's a lot of coral in one tank. But um, what? Um, so Shane, talk to us about how you bring in the corals. You know, what's what's um, brought in from wholesalers in terms of wild stuff. Um, you know, mariculture. What's aquaculture? Talk to us about all that stuff. So it's basically everything. I mean, it's everything. It's everywhere. It's anyone. It's any country. It's any who. It's it's like wherever we can find something that we don't have, we're gonna go after it, right? Like whether it's import, whether it's from, you know, hobbyists, whether it's from wholesalers here. It, it's basically like a treasure hunt, and it's it's wherever we can find something that we don't have, 
you know, we're going to go for it. You know, obviously we, we do have our import license. Um, we are importing regularly. That is part of our business model. So, you know, when it comes to the importing, um, you know, we're importing wild, we're importing mariculture, you know, when it comes to that kind of stuff, the way we basically process it is we have like a quarantine system, obviously that we, that we have, and, you know, anything that we're bringing in through import, we're, we're bringing it into our tanks. You know, we're holding it for a period of six to 12 months before we resell it. You know, we're dipping it like every single week in potassium chloride with interceptor. You know, we're looking at it under microscope and, you know, my motto is it's really survival of the fittest, right? It's like after we beat the crap out of it. And when I mean dip every week, like I mean legit every yeah. single yeah. week. Um, you, you'll you'll see that like all the corals that we have are on those black racks. So we're able to take the whole rack out at a time and dip a whole entire tank in like 10 minutes, you know, the whole rack. If, if one tank has three racks, I mean, it's 40 minutes for the whole tank. And, you know, after six months, dipping a mariculture tenuous every single week we feel that it is okay to then release it into the hobby because anything that's going to die during that rigorous dip will die off um and then you know once it starts crusting and growing and coloring that's when we're, we're comfortable like releasing it for for that for mariculture and, and for that's wild. assuming you're not bringing in any new corals into that cycle right you're basically just talking about having the same corals in that tank dipping for six uh months every week and not bringing in new uh new corals i mean yeah i mean that makes sense in terms of the life cycle if we're talking about aqua eating flatworms you know that's that's um how you kind of get out in front of that life cycle in terms of beating the eggs because you know the dips don't kill the eggs but um, if you, you know, you dip, right, there's some eggs, dip one week, and then you got some eggs or whatever, um, and you got some stuff that hatches, you know, you're, the, the weekly dips will get, will break that cycle, correct? Yeah. Yeah, no, you'll, you'll decimate. I mean, flatworms are really easy, you know, to kill. Um, I think for a lot of people, though, it's, it's a real challenge when obviously all your corals are on rocks. Like the last thing you want to do is cut your beautiful aquascape. But I think the only way to really beat flatworms is to put it on like a rack system like we've, we've shown in the videos and then dip those every week. And yeah, you dip those every week for eight weeks, you'll, you'll definitely beat the egg cycle. Um, yeah, it's acro eating flatworms, you know, it's, 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 uh, you affiliate eating flatworms are the same type. Um, you know, red bugs, black, bu black bugs are, are pain in the ass, but red bugs are easy. White bugs are easy. Those are, you know, interceptor, but you know, even for us too, like it goes beyond even like pests. It's just like the actual health of the coral, because I think when you're importing a lot, like you get a lot of corals that are stressed and they just go into like this dormant phase. And I feel like when we dip those repetitively, a lot of those just end up dying off. And so that's what I mean. Like survival of the fittest is like anything that's weak will end up just kind of like dying off and you know, because we don't want to, we don't want to sell that stuff. I mean, it'll, it'll probably end up dying. Yeah, you mentioned um, KCL. That is a very economical way to um, to 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 dip corals because um, I've talked about it a lot. <clears throat> you know, I bought like a fifty um, pound bag of uh, potassium chloride, the stuff that you use for water softeners and whatnot. Costs like fifty bucks, and uh, you know, for a hobbyist, that's like a lifetime supply. You know, if uh, if you wanted to do that, but it's it's basically just um, you know your formula was what um, for um, for dipping the uh, or or flushing every frag out before uh, you send it out to uh, tablespoons. You said per gallon. Yeah. So our, our our main dip that we dip every coral in, whether it's a acro, a torch, a gani, you know, whatever it is, it's two tablespoons per gallon for ten minutes. Right. That's what the weekly dip is. And then w before we're shipping out the acros, we're just dipping it in there and just blowing it off of the turkey baser for like 10 seconds, but still two tablespoons per, per gallon. Yeah, you know, it's uh, it, it's a great dip because not only is it very economical, but it's a clear solution. <clears throat> so you could see if anything's, you know, coming off. And and um, yeah, I mean, uh, I've seen stuff like disintegrate. I've seen acro eating flatworms disintegrate in potassium chloride because it's it's got that reverse effect in terms of sucking out all the uh the water in the cells of those uh flatworms so they they implode essentially yeah it, it'll 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 pretty much knock them dead within three minutes yeah um what else did it so yeah no i i agree quarantining is is uh is huge and yeah you do have to basically break down a reef to uh if you want to completely eradicate 
um, aggravating flatworms. I mean, there are some natural predators out there. I know Chris from ACI is a um, you know big believer in terms of using peppermint shrimp to uh, to help um, you know uh, neutralize that aggravating flatworms. They eat potentially uh, eat eat uh, they, they eat the uh, the flatworms and potentially the eggs. So, um, but yeah, I mean, if you wanted to be sure, ripping apart a reef is the way to do it. And unfortunately, <laughs> like, I joke around with people. No, I joke around with people. I say, you know, if I had a reef like legit with rocks and everything, like if I was to get any type of pest, like it, I would love to get like, like over flatworms. I would love to get red bugs. I would love to get white bugs because, it's easy. you know, with interceptor, you just decimate those in seconds, you know, you do it in tank treatment. No problem. Corals don't mind. But yeah, with flatworms, if you have a nice aquascape, like there's no way you're going to beat that unless you cut them all off the rocks. Yeah. Um, I mean, listen, I mean, I've had tanks with uh, flatworms, you know, years ago, and, and um, sometimes they'll just, uh, you know, stick to the tricolors or, or um, you know, other types of corals. Some corals they just, you know, don't uh, touch. And, you know, you, you can get by with basting, you know, kind of basting the flatworms into the water column and having the fish kind of like gobble them up, but you're not going to eliminate the problem. Um, you can, mit you know, you can mitigate it. And, um, you know, I think also... If your uh, if your tank is in really good balance and in harmony, and there's not a lot of um, you know stress in that system, then the population is not going to explode. Um, speaking of pathogens, I have a um, I have a funny flat <laughs> story on the flatworms actually. So when I first got into, I mean, I think anyone who's been in the hobby long enough, right, who do, does SPS is going to get like pretty much every type of pest. But mm -hmm. when I first got into the hobby, like I had mentors and people I looked up to, and you know, one of them. Um, was this guy, his name was Matt, right? Matt V Corals, which is yeah. like, he's an OG in the hobby. Yeah. So yeah, me and him have become like really, really good friends over the years. And, you know, he was someone who taught me a lot about the business, about how to, how things are done in terms of like corals, whatever. But, you know, I was always like looking up to him. So I was like, all right, Matt, you know, my tank's growing really good. You know, let me send you some corals, right? So like, I got a bunch of corals from Big R who I have like so much respect for, but, you know, I got like all these corals and they were growing. So I was like, all right, Matt, let me send you some, some corals, right? You're going to love these things. And I remember when he got them, I was so excited and he literally sent me a video. He's like, dude, he's like, you got flatworms bad. Mm. And he's like, show, I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? Cause I didn't know what to look for. Right. And he basically like showed me that I sent him like infested frags <laughs> of flatworms. Mm. And then I was like, oh shit. And then that was like my intro to like, I have flatworms. Yeah. Oh no. Yeah. But it's just funny, like sending him like infested corals. Yeah. Well, you know what? Back in the day in the hobby, we didn't know we were sending one another uh, infested, uh, you know, corals with like red bugs <laughs> or flatworms. I mean, you know, like years ago, that was like something like, what, really? You know, I mean, you, we always used to like get wild corals in. You know, there was no dipping and whatnot going on. You just like <laughs> deal with it. And, um, you know, the coral didn't look good. It's like, all right. But then, you know, uh, eventually everybody figured out there was pests that you had to deal with in this uh, in this hobby. And that, and that became, you know, kind of a thing. And, and it still is a thing. You know, the, um, the red bug situation, whatever kind of bug you have, that, like you said, that's an easy fix. For the most part, but still with the aquarating flatworms, that's not an easy fix on a reef tank, on a mature reef tank. Um, I mean, there's been oh, and and that's that I was gonna say that's the day when I cut all my corals off of the rocks and developed like this frag rack system, and then ever since then, like it's been no no problem. But yeah, that was that was I remember that very well. Oh, yeah, um, there's a lot of discussion going on in the chat here about lighting, and I see uh, Polo Reef, Andrew Sandler, what's up there, uh, Andrew, talking about. Um, Metal halide bulbs and double-ended uh, HQI bulbs and all that fun stuff. Um, we didn't talk about lighting, Shane, and maybe you talked about it in the equipment video. Talk to us about lighting. Yeah, so lighting, you know, a, a lot of the things I do is just things that we started with and never changed. So for my whole entire hobby and business, whatever, like we always just use radions. We use the GR4 Pros, and then obviously it evolved to like the GR5, the GR6s, but all of our lights are radion, uh, radion pros, um, you know, the fours, the five, the sixes, and, and that's all we've ever used. So like we never use any halides or anything like that. Mm -hmm. And all of, all of the lights that we use, um, we, we do like one light per foot. So like in a six foot tank, you know, we have six lights over it. Uh, we use like those radion rails for the, the holding the lights. And I believe those are about, uh, 
eight or 10 inches off the water line. And, and every single one of our tanks are set up exactly that way. Um, and then in terms of the schedule, you know, we just make it simple. I mean, we just use the, the stock AB schedule. We don't do any deviation whatsoever. And we run the lights from like 11 a.m. Uh, to 9 p.m. And we just do it exactly, you know, the AB plus schedule, you know, whatever that is. It's it's like, I think it's like 100% blues and then the whites are at like 20%. Yeah. Yep, yep, yep. That's a um, that's certainly a common schedule that folks uh, do run. Um, question I had for you before I jumped to the uh, lighting question is um, we're talking about pests. What about coral pathogens? You know, when when what what about uh, you know you get certain episodes of uh, you know a torch um, you know blows a head <laughs> or, or a, a mouth, let's say that's uh, I guess technically what it is. Um, or you, you know, you get RT and STM with, uh, with SPS. What's, um, what's your process there, you know, Shane, in terms of trying to address those issues? Yeah, it's a good, and I'm almost scared to tell people the answer because I know a lot of people are against this, but you know, we're, we deal with a lot of SPS. I mean, we we have a lot of colonies going through our hands and anytime we get a new shipment immediately on the income and then I'll, i will talk about you know existing stuff but anytime and i think this method will help people success rate like a lot of people say like oh you know we're importing mariculture tenuous and it's just dying on us and we have like a 50 percent death rate and to be honest like we used to have that but what we do is when a shipment comes in we immediately dose chemi clean into the system and that technique that secret whatever you want to call it has literally increased the success rate, you know, from like, if we import 150 colonies, you know, we're 50% used to die, maybe now like only 10%, you know, die over two weeks. And it's because of the chemi clean. I know it works. Um, sometimes like colonies will come in and they're like half dead and, you know, in dosing the chemi clean, it literally stops the RTN and it, it the coral starts repairing itself. So for any incoming shipment, for SPS, we're doing chemi clean, and for torches, uh, we're doing Cipro. It's basically uh, become a standard practice for us. And then in the main system, like that one you played with, with the 10 second clip, if anything in there is looking off, like if stuff starts RTNing, like you know from the base up, or if one day it just like ghost white in the middle of the night, it just peels, like chemi clean, go to. I mean, we probably run chemi clean every three to four months. I mean, I don't see any issue with it. I don't see anything that we have to dose afterwards. Like, I don't think there's any recovery period. Like, I could even say that I do think that bacteria runs through SPS systems. I don't know what it is. And I think that you can, instead of sitting back and watching everything die and wondering, like, what's going on and waiting weeks and weeks, just dose ChemiClean. Like, when that happens to us, we dose ChemiClean, we do a water change two days later, and a week or two later, like, things bounce back instantly. So, again, I, I don't, I'm not an expert, but I, I don't think that it's luck. And that's literally just our go-to now. Like, every three to four months, we just dose ChemiClean. I mean, it is what it is. And you're, you're doing that to your quarantine system? I mean, that's, or, or is it going to the main system too every now and then? Everything. 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 Like even, I don't know if you played the video with those torches. Um, but yeah, I mean, we get some die off in there, you know, random, like you said, like random heads just blow out and it just jellies out and we're like, uh oh, here comes a bacterial infection like Joe Cipro. And, you know, I, I do think that it stops it. I do think though, if you overdo Cipro and ChemiClean, I think it could be an, like the coral could build up a resistance to it. And, you know, for uh, that's that's what I was going to say. You know, I think that's something that that certainly we need to, uh, you know, warn folks about and talked about on this live stream before is is the issue of um, going to that well too often. And you can create um, resistant strains of um, bacteria that could potentially be be an issue. I, I know that uh, Jake Adams was was, um, you know, doing kind of regular chemi clean treatments and was getting some great results but um i think that was just kind of like at the beginning of that uh that journey and uh yeah i mean it would be great to like actually you know kind of see some long-term studies of the effect of um you know using antibiotics on our um, coral systems because we just don't know a lot at this point in time and and you know people are doing like you mentioned the cipro chemi clean oxalinic acid and um you know, we're kind of like um, kind of winging it, so to speak. But um, I do know that there's some uh, some ongoing um, research that uh, will hopefully help um, 
bring some clarity to all this stuff. But you know, that is that is something that we all do have to be careful about is is um, doing that too often, and that's something that um, you know I. I um, I always resist trying to use ChemiClean to to combat cyano because with cyano I always say is like well you know what you're not unless you're figuring out what the root cause of that problem is you're hitting it with ChemiClean then it's going to come back um, so it's a bad I've heard you say yeah. that before that's why I was yeah. so I was scared to, to say yeah, that because no, I knew that was coming but another thing that that we're that we really are cognizant about is like we, you know obviously we're selling these corals so i think like another reason why we keep like very simple systems and we don't dose amino you know we don't dose like any of that stuff is because when we sell this stuff like we want to we wanted to basically have the best chance in someone else's system so i feel like you know if you're doing aminos and all your corals look really happy but then you sell your corals to someone who isn't using amino it could be an issue right like i don't know what that stuff is called um what's that stuff it's like uh flatworm stop by kz yeah so like we used to use that a while ago and then we stopped because i heard like if you use that and stop that the corals will be affected so like we didn't want to use that and then ship corals out to someone who wasn't using it yeah. because then maybe they would have a negative effect and you know it, it does go back to the chemi clean cipro thing like any incoming shipment, we use it no matter what because we know the success rate of of the death rate is is much lower. But like we we definitely use it as little as we need to, but we do use it when we need to, and we are worried that if we overdo it, that the corals will become dependent on it, and then yeah. when we ship it out, it won't be as good in someone else's tank. So yeah, we are very careful with that too. Uh, I, I missed it. So are you actually everything that you're bringing in from wherever that, that's going into like some sort of antibiotic dip? Is that uh, what you guys do? Or do you just kind of regularly do the uh, chemi clean to the quarantine system? So like on shipment arrival, like let's say we get a shipment and it lands at like 2 p.m. We'll bring it to our, our you know, facility and then we'll literally put chemi clean into the quarantine tank. And then put the corals okay. into the chemi clean. So the corals are literally arriving into a chemi clean tank. Gotcha. And that has dramatically increased the success rate of of like new incoming arrivals. Gotcha. Gotcha. So, um, all right, man. Well, listen. This is um, this has been a very uh, interesting, educational, uh, enlightening uh, discussion. What? Um, Shane, any any uh, final words? You want to uh, you want to plug some stuff, man? You have your own uh, live stream on Instagram, right? Yeah, I mean, like the biggest plug, I guess, is like you know, follow us on Instagram. It's SBB Corals. Obviously, if you want to buy corals from us, our website is sbbcorals.com. We do have a podcast that we're coming out with. Uh, it's on YouTube. It's called Reef Keeping Podcast Secrets. Uh, right now, there's only one video on there. Those video series do start on Instagram Live. We do Instagram Lives uh, Thursday at 8 p.m., and then it goes to YouTube. So, yeah, there's, you know, if you, if you follow us on Instagram, I mean, that's pretty much like the number one for us. And you, you guys also obviously go to Frag Swaps. I, I, I think I've seen, um, I've seen you guys at uh, some Frag Swaps, right? So you're, uh, you're out and about. In the uh, only only nearby uh, New Jersey shows like Northeast, or you travel the country to go to shows. Yeah, no, we're we're big on meeting you know people everywhere, so we try to go as many shows as we can. We'll be at Reefa Palooza New York. We'll be at Reefa Palooza California. Um, you know, so yeah, we'll definitely be traveling, and and we hope to meet all you guys uh, in your state. All right, dude. Well, listen, man. I appreciate Shane you taking the uh, the time and and sharing with uh, with us all what uh, what's going on with you and and. Um, yeah, man. Appreciate uh, you taking the time, and and um, we'll um, certainly want to stay uh, stay connected to uh, to Shane. Do so by, as he said, visit his uh, Instagram and and also check him out on on YouTube. So that's going to do it for this live stream. I want to thank uh, Shane again for being on the the show. I also want to thank both Ecotech Marine and Bulk Reef Supply for sponsoring and supporting the show. I also want to thank all of you who watched tonight and participated via the chat. Um, also, a big thank you to Paul, who is the moderator as well as the president of the Boston Reefer Society. Please join and support your local reefing clubs. They are so important to the hobby. I also want to let you know that all episodes of Rapid Reef Bum are available as podcasts on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, and Amazon. 
My next Wrapping with Reef Bomb live stream will be on Tuesday, February 6th at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. My guest will be Than Thane from Tidal Gardens. He'll be back on the show. Uh, you want to check out the full upcoming schedule of guests, visit reefbum.com under the YouTube section. Until next time, be safe and be well. Later. <laughs>